Kia ora, welcome to Bahai On Air. In this episode, we're featuring the life of Lillian Weiss Alai. As a young woman in 1954, Lillian was the first person to take the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, to the islands of Samoa. The teachings of Baha'u'llah were brought to our shores by a young and remarkable woman who, with unwavering dedication, has served the Baha'i faith exceedingly well for a full five decades. I arrived in, uh, by boat actually in the Apia Harbour here in Western Samoa in January 1954. At that time, uh, I was a Baha'i youth from Australia. I left Sydney Harbour by flying boat, which landed at Mechanics Bay in Auckland, New Zealand. And from there, I caught the bi-monthly cargo passenger vessel that called at Fiji, Tonga, Niue, and Samoa. It took two weeks to reach Samoa. Recently, Baha'is from around the world helped celebrate 50 years of the Baha'i faith in Samoa. And the 20th anniversary of the dedication of the beautiful Baha'i House of Worship. One part of the celebrations was honouring Mrs. Alai, who even today is serving on the national governing body of the Baha'is of Samoa. In the year 2000, our Baha'i On Air interviewer, Maxine Salmanzade, was fortunate to have a chat with Mrs. Alai. We did it all begin. Perhaps I should say first of all that my parents uh, were migrants from Switzerland to Australia in the early 1920s. In the early days of going to high school, we used to catch a train late at night on Sunday nights and go to Barrow, which was about 25 miles away, and board for the week in Barrel and then come home Friday afternoon on the train. So also getting on this train down the track towards Barrel were three other people going to the high school who were Antoinette, Mariette and Stanley Bolton. Of course in the course of conversation they told us that they were Baha'is. My parents um, had insisted that as small children we had to go to church on Sunday. We could choose whatever church we wished. And so I used to teach a Sunday school at Presbyterian Church in the morning and Sunday school at the Methodist Church in the afternoon. And at high school, it was compulsory to go to edu uh, religi religious education classes. So that was done by the Church of England minister. So we used to go there. Where everybody in high school had to do it. And as uh, I grew older, of course, the war, the Second World War, was raging throughout the world at the time, and it was, it was a very bad period. And I kept saying to myself, listening, of course, you had to take catechism to become confirmed, and I kept saying, well, how can we be doing this? You know, we're all Christians. This is Christian fighting Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really used to confuse me, because my minister used to say, well, you know, the Buddhists are, are heathens and the Muslims are heathens and everybody, but they weren't the ones who were fighting each other. It was we Christians who were fighting each other. And then I was bothered about the concept that a child was born in sin. I couldn't see how a, a tiny baby or embryo in the mother could had any choice on how it was going to be born. So I asked these questions of the minister when my confirmation came around and he couldn't answer them to my satisfaction, so I never got confirmed. We kept up our discussions with our friends, and they told us about their religion, which was the Baha'i faith. My brother and I were very curious about this. I was about 14, you know, 13, 14 at the time. And uh, we started asking them for books and asking them about it, and we read something about it, and um, then my brother and I decided that we, would, we wanted to be Baha'is because we found from reading the books that 
this man, Baha'u'llah, who claimed to be the return of Christ and the return of all the messengers of God, had brought a new world order for this day and age in which he said the time had come for the whole world to begin to live in unity. And he actually gave a plan on how this could be achieved. And I had been thinking, you know, myself about Christianity. Well, Christianity had had 2,000 years and we still haven't achieved unity. So I thought to myself, well, why not? At least here's, here is something that gives us a plan, gives mankind a plan that he can work with to establish unity throughout the entire world, for the whole globe, you know, for the, all of mankind in the world. It didn't ma doesn't matter who it is. But then I still had my reservations about this man who was called Baha'u'llah. And I thought, now I have to read something from his own writings. And I started reading this wonderful book called The Selections from the Writings of Baha'u'llah. And I got through the first page of that book and I said, this is enough for me. And I wanted to become a Baha'i. So I became a Baha'i. So what sort of effect did, did the Baha'i faith have on you? Well, I think um, both for my brother and myself, it was these, um, you know, these, uh, you could call them principles or virtues that kindness, study, being, um, you know, honourable, um, justice, all of these different principles. And since we all had to go to religious education, we got together and we had a little meeting together and we decided that we would go to the headmaster and ask him, could we form our own Baha'i studies in the high school? So we went down to the headmaster and he said to us, do you have any Baha'i books? He'd never heard of the Baha'i faith, so he'd asked us what it was and we told him. He said, well, do you have any books to study? And we said, yes. And he said, well, go ahead in the religious hour at school, you study the Baha'i faith, and we were allocated one of the schoolrooms to do this. So we were very happy. We sat there, we did our Baha'i studies, we had discussions together. When we all graduated from high school, my parents sent me to the best secretarial college in Sydney that they could, and then they said that uh, I should go back to Switzerland to find my roots and see where my parents had come from, so I had an understanding of their background and their culture. So when I got to Switzerland and my uncle was there and I went to stay with my uncle and his family and they spoke very little English, so I had to quickly learn some Swiss German and so we could uh, communicate with each other. At that time, in 1948, around that time, the um, Shogi Fendi who was the guardian of the Baha'i faith at that time, which meant that he was the grandson of Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. And when Baha'u'llah passed away, he left a will which appointed his son Abdul Baha as the leader of the Baha'i faith. And Abdul Baha also wrote a will and testament in which he appointed his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, as the head of the Baha'i faith. So Shoghi Effendi Rabbani was his name, was the head of the Baha'i faith throughout the world and is recognized as Baha'is as such. He was the leader of the Baha'i faith at that time. And each of us wrote individually to Shoghi Effendi. And um, he, to one of my friends, he said to him, you have to return to Persia, to Yazd. He was a medical doctor. Uh, because the, the Baha'is of Yazd are suffering because they have prevented them from having medical treatment. The government has stopped medical treatment to Baha'is. And my other friend was asked to go back to Kuwait to help the Baha'i community in Kuwait. And then he asked me to go back to Australia. Just imagine when the young Lillian Wissalai came to these beautiful islands. There were no Baha'is. Now there are hundreds of Baha'is, as well as the beautiful Mother Temple of the Pacific. The Baha'is of Samoa are blessed with the courage and selflessness of this special woman. So how long were you in Europe until you were sort of guided to go back to Australia? About five years. So well, five wonderful years too. We had a great time in Europe. So when I went to Australia, the, those days, the ships took six weeks to get back to Australia. 
I got back home about Christmas 1952, and then I found myself elected to the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Australia and New Zealand. Then it was at that time we heard of the uh, what they called the World Crusade. It was a 10-year plan for the Baha'is of the world to arise and go to all the different countries and islands of the world where no Baha'is resided. And uh, we were asked or invited to go out and help establish Baha'i communities in those areas. Now at that time in 1953, um, very little was known of the islands of the South Pacific or how to get there. But being industrious, having perseverance I presume, we managed to collect a lot of information about these islands. And it's very interesting that of out of the nine people who served on that national body, six of them resigned and went out to unopened islands of the Pacific. And they later were given the title of Knight of Bahala, the first people to go there. So at that time, the Canadian National Assembly, Baha'is of Canada, governing body of the Baha'is of Canada, wrote to Australia and said, look, we have an island called the Samoan Islands and we have nobody who can go to the Samoan Islands. Can you people do anything about it? So I said, all right, I'll go to the Samoan Islands. So that's where I ended up in the end. I flew out of Sydney on a flying boat, out of Rose Bay into Auckland here. And then I caught the old, I attended the summer school in New Zealand at that time and uh, met my future husband there. And then our boat sailed into Apia Harbour and I, after coming from Europe where you've got houses everywhere, I looked around and I could just see a few churches and coconut trees and coconut trees and more coconut trees, you know, and a sea of green everywhere. Wherever you went in Samoa, there were pow pows or outrigger canoes lined up along the shoreline. There was a partially sealed road that led to our pier. And at night, people often sat on the road and played their ukuleles and sang. And I said, well, Bahá'u'lláh, you have to find the people for me. Help me to find the people. So I arrived in Samoa on the 14th of January, 1954. So you're still living in Pangopango? That's the American section. My husband and I got married in, in Fiji in November. 1954. And so we went to American Samoa because the two Baha'is who were there ha were leaving. And it was a basically a closed area at that time. You had to have special permission from the, from the governor, which was an American governor at that time. In 1959 was the first convention or conference for the entire South Pacific area of the Baha'i communities from the Cook Islands, Fiji, Tonga, uh, Kiribati, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, all these areas uh, sent delegates to this conference which was held in, in Fiji in 1959 and they elected the first governing body of the islands of the Pacific, South Pacific area. And at the bottom here are my two children, Buddy and Setare, three and four year olds, and I'm over here on the right, looking much younger than I am today. <laughs> My husband is over here. And we had a delegation from Samoa that went there to that one. And this gentleman here was the first Samoan Baha'i who really helped with the teaching work, the translation work, and was a very devoted Baha'i all the days of his life. And his name was Salala Tamasese. And his wife, who also became a very devoted Baha'i, is alive today. And in fact, um, all his children are Baha'is. And this is myself on the far side there, and Sahail here, and of course our children down below. So what do you think was the impact for the Samoan community to be introduced to this very new faith? Well, you know, we were told to go there and to make friends with people. That was the first thing we should do. We should make friends with people, but not alienate ourselves from, from the other Western community that was established there. The day after I arrived, I obtained a position as private secretary to Mr. Ted Annandale, the general manager of the well-known trading firm of O.F. Nelson and Company. I had no idea who he was 
or who the people were who worked there. But believe me, they took very good care of me and taught me the essentials of Samoan custom and watched over that single young lady from Australia. Now, at that time in Samoa, um, it was still, it was, Western Samoa, now called Samoa, was still under the League of Nations, or then the United Nations. It was then under the United Nations. It wasn't an independent state. And when it became an independent state, um, there were leading families, which were the Tamaseses and the Maliator and Mata'afa. These were the three main ones. So in drawing up the constitution, Mata'afa, whom I knew him and his wife very well because his wife was having a baby in hospital the same time I was having a baby in the hospital. And he said he would like to be prime minister. And so Tama Sese and Mali Atoa, Tanama II, became the joint heads of state of the independent state of Samoa, as it's now called, independent nation of Samoa. And the constitution provides that if one of them died, the other would be the remaining head of state until he died, and then parliament would choose who would be the next head of state. Mali Atoa himself is a very observant pe person, and he's greatly loved by his people, and he has a very strong feeling towards his people. So he knows what's going on in the country all the time. And he had been observing Baha'is for quite a long period of time because Baha'is were different to other people. They were not going out establishing churches, having collections, or giving large sums of money to different sectors of the population for them to become members of their religion. They were not really doing anything like that. So. He was very interested to see what happens when people were Baha'is in communities. And besides that, his brother had been reading Baha'i books that he had received from American Samoa, from the family in American Samoa, and he had given these books to His Highness Maliator to read. So he knew quite a bit about the faith when in 1967 the Universal House of Justice, for the second time, Bahá'u'lláh did it the first time, but for the second time the Universal House of Justice, the governing body in the world of the Bahá'í Faith, sent the proclamations of Bahá'u'lláh to the kings and rulers of the world. And the Bahá'ís of Samoa felt it would be wonderful if this proclamation could be given to His Highness Maliator. And ar arrangements were made for Hand of the Cause, who was a very dignified emissary, of the Baha'i Faith, who is a titled person, who was at that time, since he's passed away, uh, a titled person from Italy, Uga, Dr. Ugo Giacchieri, to come to Samoa and to present this volume on behalf of the Universal House of Justice to His Highness Maliator. And he came to Samoa and he waited. We waited one day, two days, three days, four days. And finally, a message came from His Highness to the proclamation of Baha'u'llah to him. And then we found out that he had built a special fale on a little offshore island down the coast, which was the same island where his ancestors had accepted Christianity. And it was in this fale that he accepted the proclamation of Baha'u'llah, which was his letters to the kings and rulers of the world on how they should treat their people, how they must change things in their country for the betterment of their people. So His Highness Malotai accepted the faith. What did that mean for the Baha'i community in Samoa? Well, of course, that brought, brought great joy to the Baha'i community and the friends really starting put, put, started to put their efforts into all sorts of work. They constructed Baha'i centres themselves. Um, they established classes everywhere. Um, they went travel teaching to other islands, like to the Tokelau Islands, um, up into the Caroline Islands, and they became a unified community. His Highness was always anxious to know what was happening in the Baha'i community. And you know, wherever he went around the world, the Baha'i community would be there with flowers and to greet him. One of the other things that was really important for all of us is the fact that he was so interested in the erection of the house of worship. 
And he used to go out whenever a piece of, we had a piece of land originally as a, a temple site property, but it wasn't large enough. And we finally obtained a piece of land up at Tia Papata, above Apia, and His Highness had come to all the different pieces of land we had looked at and had discussed it with all of us and we all made decisions, yes or no, about this piece of land. And finally we obtained this site up there. And then there was the laying of the foundation stone in, I think, 1979. And uh, the wife of Shoghi Effendi, Amatul Bahara Hiakhanum, who's Canadian, came out to Samoa. And the foundation stone for the temple was laid on that property, and His Highness laid the foundation stone. And Amatul Bahara placed inside it the dust from the shrine of Bahala at Bachi in the Holy Land. After that, we went into the construction of the temple, the house of worship, dedicated in September 1984. My sincere and this expression of thanks goes to the members of the Baha'i faith all over the world. And Baha'is all over the world came to that dedication. And this was one of the greatest joys of His Highness and he would always come up to important services at the house of worship. Samoa couldn't believe that this was something that His Highness had done. And he always told the people who came to him, I am the father of Samoa. I am responsible for the people of Samoa. But my religion is Baha'i. I'm a Baha'i. But I am the father of all the religions in Samoa. And he always will be until the day he passes. He's a wonderful, wonderful soul. And his daughter, Toa Tosi Maliator, of course, is a Baha'i. So, so how, and you married in, in Fiji, and you went together to Samoa. What was it like bringing up a family? Well, actually, you know, when we got back to Samoa, the people, the, the staff of O.F. Nelson and Company were quite concerned that I was marrying a Persian. They'd never seen a Persian. They'd seen the Fiji Indians. So it was rather funny. We had this upstairs flat across the bank, the, the, above the bank on the main street in, in uh, up here. And um, I'm hearing all this noise outside one morning and all the staff is outside down below because we were upstairs. And Soho was saying to me, what's going on down there? I said, well, I think they're coming to see what you look like, you know, <laughs> all the people. And one day the bank manager sent one of the staff up to ask me to stop washing the floor as the water was getting on the banknotes. <laughs> you know, when you place yourself in God's hands, you're always protected and assisted. Today, the Baha'i community is very widespread and they have Baha'i centers in a number of, a number of villages in American Samoa and in Western Samoa. And they have schools. They have the Baha'i Montessori School at Tia Papata. The temple area is now, what, some 20 acres, I think. And down in Apia, they also have the Apia Centre, which was built in 1959, and other buildings in the same complex there. Well, I think there's a great future for the Samoan Baha'i community, because the more they give to the community at large, the population of Samoa, the people of Samoa, these teachings of Baha'u'llah, which is for the unity of the family, the unity of the nation, and the unity of the whole world, the stronger will be our country, and the stronger we as individuals will be. I've always looked at it uh, myself when I see somebody who accepts the teachings of Baha'u'llah, and I see how they change their lives. And to me, that is the greatest gift that anybody can give you, when you see how a person changes from one way of life 
to another way of life, how their family life changes for the better, how the individual takes these teachings to his heart and changes his or her life for the better. The National Assembly of Samoa was registered with the government in 1971 in both governments, in both countries, their legal entities in both Samoa and in American Samoa. The government has granted exemption from school for school children on Baha'i Holy Days and also Baha'i marriage is recognized in both Samoa and American Samoa. So I think things are pretty good. My husband uh, died in um, five years ago, very suddenly, while he was at a meeting of the governing body of the Baha'is of Samoa. And the Universal House of Justice um, gave permission for him to be buried next to Dr. Gia Carey, the Baha'i who gave the proclamation of Baha'u'llah to His Highness Maliator. So they're buried together at the temple site.